Welcome to the Serpentine Art Technologies Twitch channel. My name is Ava, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of this year's digital commission created by Trust, a new game called Hivemind. Conceived as an open source, playable infrastructure, Hivemind has been developed as a knowledge game that allows narrative-led walkthroughs of artists' back-end working environments. The game prompts players to share insights into the artistic practices by sorting and placing key materials or inventory uh, that are uploaded at the start of the game. Yesterday over dinner, we decided to call this practice of game making lore core, since <laughs> lore is a body of knowledge that's created and held and shared by a group, and it's often oral, and it fits uh, the collective knowledge ethos of hive mind. Uh, with me in the studio today is the three members of Trust who are the project team behind this beautiful commission, Callum Bowden, Will Freudenheim, and Joanna Pope. Trust described themselves as a collective project for the R&D of shared infrastructure and imaginaries. The organization operates as a physical co-working space, a library, and a meeting place for their community. But their network extends beyond the physical as an ideas and infrastructure prototyping space for their decentralized community of researchers, designers, and artists who communicate and collaborate on projects via their Discord server and a Twitch channel. Trust were contributors to Future Art Ecosystems 1, and in 2020, we held the very first Creative AI Lab meetup group at Trust. Uh, since then, we've partnered on the R&D Labyrinths as a virtual format for showcasing artistic research. We are very happy to continue this work, uh, prototyping models to support artistic experimentation with advanced technologies. And Hivemind is a really unique artist-led infrastructure that's been built for continued use by artists and by us at Serpentine. So look out for R&D Labyrinth season two this summer where we'll invite other artists to play Hivemind. In fact, let us know if you wanna play Hivemind by direct messaging us through the Twitch channel. Before we get started, I want to thank the wider trust community, especially Arthur Rowing Bear. I also want to thank Seamus Edson for their stunning 3D design work, which you will see momentarily. Thank you to Leith Bendica, who uh, did a fantastic job advising trust on the UI direction. And I also want to thank my team in the studio today, our technical manager, Ralph Pritchard, our camera operator, Chris Penty, our BSL interpreter, Sarah Meeks and Kat Ward, and our producer extraordinaire, Alex Boys, and my fabulous co-curator, Tamara Clark-Brown. Uh, Thank you to our teammates who are not with us here tonight, Kay Watson and Victoria Ivanova. And also a special thank you to Alba Murphy, who has voiced the hive mind um, in its trailer. OK, that's enough housekeeping. So I think we're ready to enter the labyrinthine soft tissue of the artist's brain, in this case, Trust's brain, while developing the game. And I'll see you in the game world as their companion orb. All right, shall we? Okay. Let's go. Hi, everyone. I'm Callum. I'm Will. And I'm Joanna. And welcome to Hive Mind. And I'm, I'm also here just ahead of you. I'm carrying all of your inventory. It's very heavy. You brought a lot of things a lot w along <laughs> with you through this maze. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> Let's go to this nice pink hive. So. Thank you for the intro, Ava. Today we're going to be playing Hive Mind with Hive Mind itself. So we're taking a more meta and reflective um, perspective on our process building this game, which in the future will be kind of uh, used as an infrastructure by other artists and creative practitioners. So yeah, we're going to be kind of commenting on what it's been like to develop this game, our research process, uh, obstacles and some dead ends along the way and uh, we'll also have time to respond to questions from the chat so make sure you throw those in there and then yeah we can keep the conversation going as we move through the labyrinth. Um, a little bit about how you play Hivemind is um, you play as this character called the librarian 
um, where you explore this labyrinth space and as you move through the world, come across these different hives, um, which when we enter one, will open up our inventory um, and prompt us uh, with uh, a question. Here we go. So which hive are we entering now? It seems to be called Hello World. Hello the... World. Hello. Hello World. <laughs> <laughs> so in this hive, I think we're going to talk about what you brought with you. What's in your inventory? What did you bring to show us? All right. So yeah, this is our inventory. We have all these different categories of things that we've brought today. And let's see. Should we bring something from our output? From output, yeah. yeah. So, as I was saying before, in this kind of meta spirit of hive mind, what we brought with us today, our tool, is hive mind itself. So, um, here you see the trailer for the game. I was kind of curious, Joanna, what you think, or like how you think hive mind ties into the wider trust uh, practice and like. The, the role you play in the Discord is this like community facilitator. Right, yeah, I'm one of the maintainers of the Discord server uh, together with Arthur. And um, yeah, for people who maybe don't know, we um, have like a membership system and people in the Discord can participate in different kind of community events. Um, one of them that I've really, really enjoyed doing is called Sandbox. And um, it does remind me a little bit of this game. So with Sandbox, you can just present any project that you've been working on and you just share like any materials that um, are important to you for it, whether it's like pieces of research that influence you, like maybe like, yeah, artifacts from the process. Um, and what's really cool about it is that it's like, people get to show um, their personal projects as they're a work in progress or reflect on them after they've been done. And usually people say that they get um, a really interesting and different view on, on their work. And um, yeah, I think it would, I think this game can definitely have the similar effect. So yeah, I'm curious to see like how it feels for us to talk about our own work through this. Totally. Cool, should we go to the next? Yeah, yeah over let's walk around. So. You can just exit before we get to it. Yes, I must exit the <laughs> hive. <laughs> I need to leave my little nestled yeah. plug in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for powering that hive orb. How Where does are we going next? Which uh, which, which direction do you all think? Um, I like the look of that orange one. Maybe. This one? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Maybe, Will, can you tell me a little bit about the walls of the labyrinth? Sure. Are they porous are they solid can we go through them yeah so they're they're made of they're made of solid material but as you move uh through the labyrinth you kind of leave these little trails um of these little glowing lights um on the walls and even sometimes on plants that you pass along the way um and the 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 walls themselves while they're solid in the sense that you can't walk through them are are porous when dealing with light um, so you can see they're, they're kind of have this glow. They're often lit from the bottom. Um, mm, fleshy. They're, yeah, they're made out of a soft flesh, mm -hmm. as are the hives themselves, I would say. I'm trying not to get lost. Yeah, yeah what happens when you can't find your way? I'm not sure. Mm. We'll, we will definitely experience that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Okay. All right. Here I go. <laughs> Bloop. And um, so the game randomizes the location of the hives. So even though we are the game makers, we're not sure like which hive we're gonna get when. Yeah. Um, we've arrived at the lore hive. Oh, that's a good one to. It's a good start. <laughs> that's yeah. lucky that we got that. Because <laughs> yeah. now it'll make a lot more sense for everyone. What's <laughs> So tell me the origin myth of your, your tool, Hive Mind. So this is what's known about Hive Mind so far. The labyrinth. It is not clear where the labyrinth is located, who created it, or where it came from. Legend says that in the separation of the known from the unknowable, 
a maze with no beginning took shape in the void. Its thread has been lost, and the labyrinth has been lost as well. What at first appears as a weaving and meandering structure made of a solid material unravels into something fleshy and irregular composed of organic cells. Light does not reflect, but it diffuses through it. It seems more like a living creature than something not animate. Its walls seem to contain stars and celestial fungi. And I'll talk a little bit about the librarian, who's our friend over here. The librarian is an inhabitant of the labyrinth who diligently tends and cares for its life. Some say the librarian is a star whose beautiful duty is to imagine and perform the maze and its thread. Lovely. I can talk about the hive and the orb. Cool. So to keep the labyrinth alive and to find a performer thread, the librarian creates hives of activity by offering things from the inventory. And the orb, uh, who you've already met. Long ago, a star grew so large and boisterous it could no longer be contained within the walls of the labyrinth, so it fell out. <laughs> Not one to leave a, a lone star to wither and die, the librarian raised the orb as their companion. The orb is as curious as they are forgetful. More of a mirror than a container, the orb echoes everything the librarian needs to activate the hives and perform the labyrinth's thread by projecting an inventory. Thank you, well, Joanna. I feel so seen. <laughs> How does it feel, orb? Yeah. You are a star. I don't know. You are a star. I'm slightly sure. take, I'm taking offense to the fact that I'm forgetful. <laughs> <laughs> and you always say that. Yeah. I always say that. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll talk about the thread crumb. As the librarian moves through the labyrinth, they fertilize its flesh. In the wake of each step, ecologies of stars and celestial fungi grow. I hope everyone enjoyed that. <laughs> I, did, I did a lot. <laughs> and please, this is just what we know about the labyrinth so far in yeah. hive mind. So if you have contributions or ideas. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know something else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is a living document. Yeah. Please post in the chat. Cool. All right. All right. Cool. Onward. Um, okay, we definitely came from there then. Shall we go this way? Let's do it. Maybe try to find that blue one. Yeah. Can you go through the tree and make a dress? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see if this one's low enough. Sometimes the librarian likes to decorate themselves. With Wait, the maybe that one there. So yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, so cute. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> even the even the plants themselves are a little bit fleshy here. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it's very cozy core. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know who? Yeah. Can you also decorate the walls a little bit with? Oh the yeah, trim? absolutely. It's like the fun things that you can do. <laughs> Be good to like have more. The stars. Yeah. Oh, so Orb that was once you. <laughs> These are all like, yeah, t teeny orbs. I, yeah, are they like baby orbs or like? Yeah, they could one? be. What is the relationship? Ooh, oh, the, the, yeah, the orb, can go th the orb can go through walls. I should have mentioned that before. <laughs> oh yeah, I know what's going on on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes gotta, you can. I've got to check on all my offspring. Yeah. <laughs> wow, offspring. <laughs> there's hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of little orb children. But not all of them live. Oh, there's got to be some good drugs. <laughs> Bringing some darkness and drugs. No. All right, no one has to be like too wholesome now. Where are we lost? Um, no, I think this is... Oh, we got one. Here we go. This looks like a fresh hive. Mm. So fresh. All right. Ah, Ooh, research, research hive. Research hive. Um, it's a big, big one. It's a big one because we love researching. <laughs> 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 Callum, do you want to start this one off? Yeah, so... Hivemind is asking me to show the fields of knowledge and research that the tool is based on. Mm. Um, so, at a, at the most like basic level, Hivemind emerges out of uh, research that Trust did for the Serpentine R&D platform uh, back in 2020, I think, mm. um, thinking about ways of communicating the back-end uh, infrastructures that artists working with advanced technology develop through their practices. Um, and we ended up looking at a range of references from both gaming and also anthropology and archaeology, looking at uh, both methodologies for breaking down process, um, understanding the heterogeneous elements that go into making anything in the world, 
um, and also kind of taking inspiration from video games for how to represent process um, and threads in a symbolic way, in a visual way. And so um, I'll go into some more detail about uh, the operational chain, which is this kind of methodology from archaeology and anthropology in a moment, but a bit about the visual inspiration. We looked at um, skill trees in video games, which are these uh, graphical representations of the current skill level of a character. Uh, we looked at recipes in Zelda Breath of the Wild. We looked at combo animations in a game called Hearthstone. And we also looked at um, Dance Dance Revolution, which is this uh, process-based dance uh, activity. Um, and that research was done with Arthur Bear. Uh, so yeah, shout out to Arthur. Shout out to <laughs> Always a shout out to Arthur. We get an A in the chat for Arthur. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, and so the operational chain uh, is kind of the backbone of Hivemind. It comes from a archaeologist called André Leroy Gouron, a French anthropologist archaeologist who in the 60s proposed operational chains as a methodology for breaking down technical activity into its constituent um, parts. So he was kind of looking at energy, forms of knowledge, gesture. There's a lot of emphasis put on the body and the role that the body plays in making artifacts. Um, and what was also nice about looking at the operational chain is it often resulted in these kind of labyrinthine diagrammatic representations of uh, the creation of an artifact. Um, we were talking about this diagram earlier and looking at how museum collectors is connected to the natural world via corrosion, wars, and destruction. <laughs> it's not a subtweet. <laughs> I know. So, we're sorry, legacy institution. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we did a reading group on this as well, and we showed some diagrams to the community, and everyone was really obsessed with them because, yeah, mm. I don't know. And it, it's cool because it's like, it's even though it's for like, yeah, these prehistoric art forms and tool making, it actually applies really well to, yeah, like digital art process, I guess. Mm. It's also interesting, too, how they often jump between like really material and really abstract. Like, like often the interconnections are very abstract, whereas then the things that you're looking at are like changes to a physical form. We actually um, have an extract from the reading group that Joanna was mentioning in the Trust Discord, and this is kind of um, a common feature of Trust's process and activities where when we're working on ideas and developing ideas, um, we bring them into the Discord through events and um, host discussions around them. And so we'll give a kind of taste of what that was like. Do you want to do just one of the extracts? Yeah. yeah. Do you want the good. more the more like reading groupy one or the more? Does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Sure. The vibes. Yeah. Give us. Should the vibes. we show the vibes? Sure. Yeah. Is yeah. Often, art with technology is made so. by technicians okay, based on the concepts <laughs> created by. Often, art with technology oh, no. is made by. Same? Often, art with oh, technology no. is made Let's just by pretend this is what we wanted. Here, should we let them see that? So, you guys are in the audio channel of your Discord right now. Artists. That's what we're seeing. Um, yeah, exactly. For those people who don't use Discord, can you just describe it in one sentence? Should we wait till the recording mm. is finished? And so I thought that was really interesting also that like even in these analyses of prehistoric artifacts, there's like seeing the different types of technical knowledge um, contribute to status in different ways. That's super interesting. Yeah, I kind of got the feeling like maybe the, you know, this technical knowledge, the enskillment was potentially more valued more or had more of a like kind of reputational impact than uh, at least it maybe does for artists today, you mentioned how like technicians can sometimes be erased if they're like hired by artists to kind of produce some some like technically impressive work. Um, so I thought that was like maybe an interesting comparison, or you know maybe the idea of like deliberately focusing on the back end and on how technology is used as a way to kind of yeah appreciate and scalement again um, as it was appreciated in prehistoric societies. I don't know, Will, if any of this resonates. Um, 
with you and the various like tools and software that you use for your practices or your peers um what do you think there's like if there's any connection between how people use the technology and then like perform their use of it like how does it inform social relations i don't know if any of that is like yeah speaking to you right now i guess it to reading this section made me return to the first one I, I was thinking back to like the five heuristically separated elements and i was trying to think if those still map on as readily like there's matter energy objects gestures and sequence and knowledge and like even in throughout, throughout the production of this process i definitely was thinking a lot about like gestures and sequence and just like um the, the like the act of working with software and like especially like unreal engine the coding is often like using these node-based tools where i'm like literally drawing these like little rope kind of connectors between nodes constantly it, like very feels very gestural all the time much more than it does feel like like writing um and so like some some aspects of these feel like very related the, the like distinction between matter energy and objects at least for the kind of work that i do feels like difficult to differentiate when i'm thinking about an operate like describing creating this game as like an operational chain um so i'm curious like what like what if if the current current kind of moment of like digital work has different elements um or if or if we can kind of break them down in the same way what is this um image we're looking at joanna this is uh i guess it's a screenshot from from the server the orb also asked us about like yeah maybe for people who don't know uh, how Discord is. I mean, basically the way that we do these reading groups is that there are these voice channels in Discord. So we all hop in there, usually without video, because that's kind of more comfortable, I think. And um, I select some excerpts from a text and read them out loud and then pause in between the different sections and we just kind of riff on, on different ideas. Usually I have co-hosts, so this time it was Will and Callum. Um, also people from the community can jump in. Uh, so yeah, it's really fun. To, to do this and yeah as you said it's a cool way to kind of get the community's thoughts on ongoing um, projects that are incubated at, tr at trust sorry yeah cool cool <laughs> to the next one. yeah, yeah I let's think do so. it all right i was really sitting in the hallway during that recording Oh yeah. That's why my microphone sounded <laughs> terrible. I was I was reading a comment from Joanna on the screenshot <laughs> of the Discord where <laughs> she, she writes me hunched over my computer. <laughs> I forget what, what the context was. Very gestural. Right I, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, kind of lo that. locked yeah. in by this microphone. So. Oh. so are we are we building an operational chain as we're going from hive to hive? Is that is that part of what we're doing or is that just the starting place? I think it feels like we are in the way that we, when you look at the operational chain diagram, it's maybe more like a kind of chaotic way of reading mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like part of the way, or what's interesting, at least for me about this, is that um, you're forced to tell a story about the creation of your work in like a completely random order. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, the chaotic reading of the operational chain maybe <laughs> is how I would describe it. Does, that, like that. does that, does I'll that? I'll accept it. Okay. I like Definitely. the chaotic operational Yeah, chain. chaotic operational chain, mm -hmm. yeah. Also the nice, oh, sorry. No, Will. go ahead, Orb. No, I was gonna <laughs> say. <laughs> I just like how there's so much subjectivity that's allowed to be part of the mm. um, operational chain. And that's, I guess, what it was criticized for at one point. But that's something that I love about this game, that it includes all of the sort of like social interactions and the weird coincidences and mistakes that led to the creation of a work. And I also like it as a metaphor almost better than the front end and back end that we mm. started from because it's less binary mm -hmm. and it shows how you navigate between those different spaces and you're going to the front and back all the time. Mm. That's a good point also yeah. um, because like within an academic context, operational chains are made by like researchers who are not embedded, like they're not part of the process. Mm. They're external to the process. So they're kind of looking at it from this outsider perspective whereas we're making a game that people can play themselves to like understand their process differently or play with their process or present their process in a narrativized way um so i think like have inviting people to do it themselves is interesting yeah i was also thinking too that the the little mini map up in the right like if were those were each point 
uh, labeled, I feel like, and, and maybe connected to each other could start to form something like an operational chain yeah. diagram yeah. too. Yeah, um, we could experiment with different things. I mean, I guess this game is kind of continuously in development, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we could play around with like, um, yeah, leaning more into that metaphor or not. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, and for what it's worth, I guess I guess we might as well explain. Those are the places we've been. Those each of those dots on the map are the hives that we've we've entered. So this purple one. We visited three out of nine hives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. where should we go next? That one looks unexplored. Which which one? Uh, yeah, yeah. The pink at the back. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Where is that? There's Did no glitter. Already... I think the, we've been the, the pink uh, far in the back. We definitely the, yeah, yeah. To oh, there's two over that. there. <gasps> oh, uh oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Our favorite prompt. <laughs> so, when we reach dead ends, we get thrown weirder questions. Yeah. So this one is, what's your favorite number? And we don't get an inventory here. To no. Us. <laughs> Should we all say uh, on the count of three? Ooh. Sure. One, two, two three. 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 Who said oh, three? I said three, I said three. Two. Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's nice. What did you say, Joanna? I said seven. I said four. You would be a four. Yeah. <laughs> symmetrical. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it fits him so much. He's such an even number. Such a four. Okay, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the chat, post your favorite number. Post your favorite number, please. Yeah. Please. Is this Are you an even or an odd? Mm. Mm. That's actually a big, like... It's really there's big. There's two kinds of people point. in this world, like... <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. There's one binary. Yeah. <laughs> even you numbers even and odd, odd numbers. numbers. Mm. Yeah, I like these kind of funny dead end questions. Like, I guess the intention is to break up the the discussion of the game, mm -hmm. or like yeah. just kind of throw you <laughs> throw you off a little bit in a friendly way. We like that one. We'll see. What yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once we get, I'm just doing a little sprinkling here. Nice. You're doing some decorating. I hear yeah. some giggling from the moderation team. Is there <laughs> something happening in the chat? Are people posting their numbers? Yes. All good from Thank the moderation okay, team. Cool. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for posting your chat. Keep your your yeah. number. <laughs> Keep that going. All right. <laughs> Ooh, well, we, we have a four, a, another, another four, four so that's a will. Yes. And we uh, got some sevens, Joanna. I literally couldn't. An count. eight, another <laughs> even. Is that an, oh, a six. six. That's a weird choice. Huh. That's a, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I like multiples of three. Okay. So from the chat, we're getting eight, seven, mm. 27, 72. Wow. Oh, I totally eight. didn't even think about two digit numbers. Well. <laughs> six, four, twenty. You can go that far. <laughs> nine. <laughs> Damn, that's blowing my mind. Thanks everyone for participating. It'd be cool to think of other ways to like engage with the Twitch chat for other versions of this. Yeah. Um, will you have? Right. Show me the context in which your tool is situated. <laughs> well, we've, okay. You want to start with this network possibly? Yeah, that's nice. So we wanted to reflect a bit on everyone who has c contributed to Hivemind. Um, as we were kind of mentioning, the project started with um, research at Trust. Um, it then kind of moved into this first season prototyping a way of talking about backend infrastructure, which we called R&D labyrinths. Um, and then for the past few months or so, we've been working on Hivemind to create a game out of this research. And so um, I just want to thank all of the people who have like helped along the way and participate in this. So uh, Malta Zander, Philip Ullman, GVN908, <laughs> Shunla Pham, Greg Oke, uh, Arthur Rowing Bear, Shivani Hassard, Maitia Mirgens, uh, Will sat next to me, <laughs> Joanna <laughs> sat next to me, uh, Seamus Edson, who uh, we worked with on 3D design. Mm -hmm. um, S in the chat for Seamus. S in the chat. Yes, S in the chat Seamus, for Seamus. If you're watching, you yeah, if you're. Hello. Yeah. yeah, say hello, say hey. share you your so favorite much. number. Yeah. For your amazing work on this. Um, uh, we want to thank Laith Benkeda for um, advising on the UI. And of course, um, Eva Yeager, um, our illustrious orb, and Tamar <laughs> Clark Brown, part of the moderation team right now, but instrumental in the realization of Hive Mind. And then we've shown the Discord a yeah. little bit, but here's a here's another glimpse. This is what it a looks zoomed like. out view. 
Yeah, wait, can you go back in? So we can oh, like talk about the, we've got a bunch of channels. Um, the knowledge channel is probably like the irrelevant one for this where we kind of think about um, different ways of organizing and storing knowledge or what counts as knowledge. Um, I really like the play and active forms channel as well and world building. So like lots of inspo from there. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we kind of talk about game mechanics um, and yeah, obviously world building. Um, so yeah. Join the Discord. Join the Discord. <laughs> uh, anything else we want to show for this hive? Um, I think not. I, th right. I, th I just really like this as a hive question because it's like really nice to reflect. Like I wasn't, we weren't just like solo artists working on this. There's like a ton of people involved, mm -hmm. um, and everyone influenced it in different ways. And I think this is really the case for just every like artistic or any project, really. So definitely. Yeah, it was really amazing. Like putting this like list of names together also yeah. to think about how many people have and there are many actually that like could not fit on this list so this is more like directly from a trust angle mm -hmm. um i guess here we also shout out to victoria ivanovov uh, who played a big role in the initial research uh, mm -hmm. phase of uh yeah the project nice four out of nine Four of nine. We haven't found a single green one yet. Is there like a, a fun dead end somewhere? <laughs> like this? No. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you guys can talk a little about all of this foliage and plants oh, and yes. how it grew as you were developing the game and how like the spatiality of the game influenced you. Mm. These Celestial fungi. Mm. And materials of the game. Yeah, I mean, partly at least in terms of these little these little um, celestial fungi growing around us, we were thinking about this concept of, of thread crumbs <laughs> and like leaving leaving little bits behind as you go, both as a marker in the in the kind of operational chain mentality of like markers of where you've been, um, being able to find your way back or like signaling um, to to know what what areas have been unexplored, um, but also across the labyrinth. We have a variety of different, uh, slightly different biomes of different plants, which also serve as an indicator of if you've been to a place or not. Um, and different plants here grow better uh, using different different light. So here, these uh, this type of grass grows really well with this more reddish orange light. Mm. Um, others require. Well, actually, I don't think anything really grows well in the green light. That's odd. <laughs> yeah. Interesting choice. It's a very, very different cosmos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Maybe Sometimes green, green means like death in this universe or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Oh, here we go. Oh, do we? Well, these. It? Okay, wait, hold on. These guys grow pretty well in the green light. Oh, but yeah. Not really anybody else. I think they need Only to be near the sprouts. hive. I think they have some sort of symbiotic relationship with the hive, probably. Definitely. They, they take on, often, they take on the kind of. Uh, branch color. Yeah. Hmm. All right, get Where in there. Got now. here. Get go. in there. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, prototype hive. Here we go. Oh, this is a good one. Um, All right. So show me some sketches and tests or prototypes of hive mind. Sure. Um, well, so we have quite a bit of documentation throughout the process. Um, as we as we kind of met um, over the course of about a month and a half or two months. We did regular kind of Zoom call meetings where we were showing the the, the game as it developed. Um, so we have a bunch of documentation, screen recordings of here's an incredibly early version <laughs> with the Unreal Engine running. default mannequin guy running around <laughs> <laughs> through a very poorly mit, <laughs> lit maze. Um, there was a lot of stones on the floor. A lot of thinking around the shape of the labyrinth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there's a little bit of a zoom out. Um, yeah, at first also we were playing with these uh, like structures. Like we wanted um, Seamus off the bat. Oh, there he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's a little bit of the Blender file actually showing an early version of the of the maze. Um, yeah, we were thinking about ways of, of having structures that could go up and out above the labyrinth. So you'd have, because we had these hive destinations, we wanted them to be visible and uh, from a distance and have directions that you would want to move in as opposed to just kind of fully randomly exploring. Um, so thinking about, that was like a big question early on. And also partly why um, with some like hedge maze type situations, the labyrinth can be really tall or, or really small. And um, we, we keep it at about a little bit above the, the librarian's height 
Um, but us as players are able to kind of camera our way around looking out in a nice way. Um, we can kind of see into the distance a little bit. Um, here I could show a couple more iterations. This is when we started to get the light to work with a and a, a little bit of fleshiness going here. I love us on the right side, just <laughs> yeah. looking seriously <laughs> Yeah, on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So you made this in Unreal, right? Yes, yep. This was made in Unreal Engine and Blender. And Blender. Can you talk a little bit about um, like what stylistic things are a direct result of Unreal? Like, are there some characteristics? Mm. I think well the the this kind of lighting uses their the Unreal Engine like subsurface scattering model, mm. um, which is basically kind of a way of calculating how um, semi-translucent objects deal with light. Um, so if you think about like when you have your hand up against a flashlight, um, the the kind of way that you see the red color through your skin um, is basically how we're dealing with light here. Um, and, and doing that across all of the, the plants and the player um, all kind of use this model of, of lighting. Um, that was one of the, the things that really interested us. Also, like, over, the, over my time working with this tool, I've built a lot of, like, sub-tools. Um, so one of them is, like, a plant scatterer, mm -hmm. um, which, is, was, which was used kind of constantly throughout the development of this project. And that's so Seamus would give you the, the plant files and then you would use that to scatter them throughout the maze. Exactly, yep. Um, and the scatter tool can do things like, um, you know, you could drop in a few variations and it'll spread them around or you can have like fall off from the center. So they start really big in the middle and then get smaller as they kind of move across. Um, which Is you that see how you make here. them attracted to different light colors? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very yep. nice. Um, let's see if there's any other fun ones here. Um, here's some experiments now with better lighting and an early hive model, which I can show. And an more. early UI. And an early UI. Yep. I really like that other that other librarian model. <laughs> <laughs> like, Use your character. Okay. <laughs> what if it was like a first person I love shooter? That. <laughs> yeah. Joanna's like, librarian is this. Yeah. <laughs> really big. Cyber. Librarians yeah. are really Cyber strong. Cyber warrior. They it's true. I like it. Yeah. So <laughs> shout out to all the librarians. <laughs> yeah. Shout, shout out, out to, to librarians. librarians. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can show. Here's a couple early. This is an early hive model. Apologies, Seamus, if you don't want me to show this. <laughs> We're showing it anyway. <laughs> We're being vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this game is all about. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, I can show, here's an early model of the labyrinth itself, which I don't think is cheating, but maybe we're a little bit, yeah, I don't no. know where we uh -oh. are here. Oh, um, don't look away. <laughs> <laughs> this is a god view. Yeah, yeah, yeah god If view. anyone in the <laughs> chat solves it, yeah, yeah. it's secret. Mm -hmm. But when we landed in the labyrinth, we weren't yes. at the outside. We were right. We were at the center. Middle. We were at the very center. Yeah. Um, yeah. So solving it is kind of a it's a tricky thing. There's no way out. That's really, that's like a small ego yeah. boost. Mm. <laughs> yeah, mm. Definitely. You could do this maze forever. Mm. There's kind of no thread. I right. mean, yeah. You can always go back to the hives and be like, mm, I want to look at that piece of inventory mm -hmm. again. Right. That's kind of nice. Here's a little and tree. And do you it's see really nice. do you see the librarian adding to the inventory in the hives or building out new mazes so they would return to the first maze and mm. then venture into the second as the project iterates or as they go on to a new project? That's a really interesting. I imagine question. both. I imagine returning to different returning to hives with the same prompts with different materials. Um, and kind of changing your answer a little bit. W one thing to note too is that right now, while while you can constantly swap out what's in a given hive, you always end up leaving one thing. Um, and so having that one thing be changeable over time um, is appealing. But but I think mm -hmm. also to extend adding more hives and extending the kinds of questions that you're asking about a tool as it continues to to develop is is interesting. But yeah. also maybe at some point in a process you could play hive mind and not be able to like feed the a certain hive. Yeah. And then so maybe you just leave it empty and then you come back mm -hmm. at a later point in time. Definitely. I thought about it when we visited the milieu hive mm. that maybe all of the different contributors could then have their own sub hives mm. and you could leave 
prototypes or data sets or resources for That's your milieu. Mm -hmm. What if you could like, <laughs> you could like, to pick up. you could nest in one of the hives, like maybe this is like in a future version, but you could, when you walk around, you're like, mm, I really like the prototype one. I'm going to set up camp here. And then mm -hmm. maybe you can like bring all the stuff or like collect sustenance and store it in there or something. Yeah. People like leave a base. things for yeah. others to find. Mm. Um, I guess, yeah, that would be really cool also as like a multiplayer version, like to see mm -hmm. the light that other people have scattered or the objects. I don't know, it'd be really exciting to think more about, yeah, mm -hmm. where we can take this. It definitely would live to the name of, of Hive Mind. It would, sure. yeah, I think it needs to be a multiplayer. Itself. Also, like, <laughs> as you get more and more people playing this, like, what are the types of things that end up in the different hives? Yeah, like, knowing the interpretations. Yeah, like how people have interpreted their own work in different ways is cool. Mm. Definitely. And how many prototypes did you guys have in the end? Ooh, that's a good question. Is a prototype a discrete thing or just like something that never ends? <laughs> Is it like the labyrinth? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it felt like a constantly changing, yeah. emerging <laughs> thing. It, we had discrete meetings where I had to show a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we had four that's of those. <laughs> so maybe that's the counter. Um, but but yeah, it felt like it was it was constantly evolving over the, over the and how many people did you bring into those meetings? So was it important to you to test things with artists or did you test them on yourselves? Mm. We could show um, an image from a workshop that we did right at the beginning, um, which is in research, I think. The Figma. Oh. Oh yeah. It's hard to see here because it was a complicated activity, <laughs> <laughs> but we um, ran a series of workshops um, like with ourselves, with Ava and Tamar, um, to kind of like understand the, the needs of the game, the needs of artists playing the game, um, to test our assumptions about different design elements, like Another workshop we ran was on the, the prompts and the questions themselves, um, where uh, Ava and Tamar brought artistic projects that they had worked on and um, tried to respond to the prompts with an early version of an inventory. Mm. So we did a lot of like paper prototyping also yeah. um, before we brought things into 3D. Our paper was like Google Drive a lot. Mm -hmm. Google Drive, Figma. Right. Shout out to Figma, yeah. Fig, Fig Jam. <laughs> What's a paper prototype? Mm. A paper prototype often in game design is when um, you have a concept for a game and before it's worth spending significant amounts of time like actually developing something digital, even if that's ultimately the the goal, is to, is to find a way of making a paper and pencil version of the game, often with little like physical objects that are moving around um, in a way to, to get the out, mechanics yeah. out, to play it with people and just like figure out, is this fun? Like, is this interesting? Do we have something worth like actually investing in? Um, and oftentimes you have like a, a concept and then make like 10 different paper prototypes of variations of a mechanic or an idea. Sorry, I'm getting distracted in the inventory. <laughs> um, Should we move on to the next hive? Let us move sure. on. Let us move on. Do you guys have the feeling you want to get to all nine? Are you hmm. feeling anxious? I no. It, no. I mean, it's Never. chill. <laughs> There's no rush. Like, we can, if we don't get to all nine, it's okay. Yeah. But it would be funny to try and play this game really fast. <laughs> yeah, do a speed, speed run version. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. oh, that's a good one. Or that's, oh, wait, have we been there? I don't okay. think so. The blue one, I don't think oh, we've yeah. been there. I'm also curious if, like, um, for people watching, how our process compares to processes that you've used in your projects and work. And, mm. um, yeah, I, I'm interested in kind of, like, comparing notes about if things feel similar or different. So this is the lore hive we have yeah, yeah. before. No, 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 the one, wait, could turn around for a sec and go to the left. It's actually really hard to play and talk at the same time. <laughs> Maybe give Will the mouse. Navigate the maze. <laughs> Literally that losing, losing the, the thread. <laughs> losing It'd also the, be good the, to the know from people 
if they relate to the hive names. So we've been to the lore hive, the prototype hive. Um, what other hives would people want to collect their mm. inventory? That's, a really That's cool. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that from anyone. Obstacle hive. <laughs> mm. Let's see. So we had, yeah, dead ends, turning points. Um, let's see, where did we put some of those? Um, one of them was initially we were thinking about the hives as shrines. Um, Dream hive, that's nice. <laughs> Dream hive. There actually Ooh. is an obstacle hive. We haven't gotten there yet. We're on it now. Oh, we're, we're here. An obstacle oh my god. We've Good arrived. Alex idea. wishes our command. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah, one maybe less obstacle, but like turning point moment was uh, the, ori the original metaphor for what has become uh, hives was was shrines, and we kind of the, the very first version of this game was uh, involved the artist placing all of the assets at the beginning, um, and have and move, working through the labyrinth as a way of rediscovering them, um, and then we started thinking about shifting to this more organic metaphor. And once we came on the idea of of hives, then we started thinking about well, maybe we should be bringing something to the hive. Um, also, because like the whole idea of the operational chain is that any seemingly stable object or artifact in the world is in fact made up of like complex, uh, nonlinear processes of like different parts. So it, whether it's different types of energy, different types of knowledge, different technical skills, different people. Um, and having the shrines with these like fixed <laughs> gallery displays yeah. felt in dissonance to like the ethos of the operational chain. And so uh, going back to like anthropology, which for full disclosure, I studied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, I know, surprise, surprise. Um, there's this idea of uh, hives of activity, which come from an anthropologist, Tim Ingold, uh, which is like the way he describes these networks of heterogeneous things. Um, so like taking inspiration from this idea of the object or the artifact as a hive of activity, we uh, explored the hive as a maybe more compelling metaphor for um, like, how artists could archive their process in a non, like, uh, con constrained way. Mm. I mean, I think what we did take away, like the good part from the shrine thing that we managed to keep is this like idea of these little, um, yeah, memory spaces or like mm. little, um, I don't know, I don't want to say memorials because it's like, yeah, as you said, it's still like live, it's a living project and so on. Um, but I think uh, it is really nice to honor like those moments of a of a project where yeah you normally wouldn't see it it's behind the scenes, but it's you know it's equally important. It's really nice to be able to like have special places for them. So the output has the same kind of shrine as the like back end. Right. Yeah. Everything yeah. is on the same level. Right. It's mm -hmm. like you know the the end result isn't the main thing here, and um, mm -hmm. that's yeah the really like the focus of this yeah, project. Cool. I think. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the chat, people are suggesting the w wine hive, oh, the wine bar hive. hive, the bar hive, <laughs> <laughs> which hive? That's the where process I'm going. Hive. Yeah. Bar hive. Yeah, we forgot the bar. <laughs> so they both they want wine and a bar. <laughs> but also the energy <laughs> hive, which I think is mm, really nice so because yeah. that's great. It's really good to talk about like the kind of burnout process, mm. and the self doubt that's involved in making a project that's never been made before and getting lost along the way and. You know, we hit a couple dead ends, but we're here as a group. And like, if you're hitting those dead ends on your own, how do you guys feel about that? I think um, it's interesting that hearing about like energy made you go to like um, <laughs> social energy or like mm. the energy that people put into things that they work on. Yeah, that's how I read which it. Which is but super, which is super nice because um, in this like uh, breakdown of technical activity from uh, the operational chain, like one of the elements is energy, yeah. but we felt it was kind of too abs abstract and like, cause we were conceiving of it as like, like carbon energy or like yeah. what type of energy goes into your, from a more literal angle. Rather than your body. Which is super interesting. Mm. Another way I was just thinking about it too though, is like 
almost in contrast to the orb's description just now would be like what what gives your project energy or like what gives you the energy to continue mm. on with a project would also be an interesting prompt to i think yeah, explore I like in the future like what how do you keep bringing yourself to this thing over time yeah i think that's a, such a good question for all projects like often it can be something completely like unrelated to what you're working on as well <laughs> like mm. i don't know like if you pick up a hobby or something like that and then you're like oh, this is really giving me energy to work <laughs> on this like draining project <laughs> for, do you have a hobby that has been giving you energy definitely drama? okay i just want to say hi to all my knitting circle friends <laughs> <laughs> uh that's something i've been doing at trust uh I, like at the same time as we've been working on this so yeah uh knitting and crochet i don't know it's like a good outlet to have so highly They're recommend saying hi joanna hi <laughs> <laughs> miss <Knitting>. you guys <laughs> i was very knitting impressed circle though. loves you oh <laughs> jay for joanna in yeah. the chat. oh man <laughs> Okay, we also have the community hive, which I would say is an um, easier way to say milieu hive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, We've been forcing the orb to pronounce a lot of uh, <laughs> French, French words. French words. <laughs> Again, <laughs> the distributed dependent, <laughs> the distributed <laughs> dependencies hive. Oh, really dependencies is great. With that one. Yeah, that's a really good one. Good job. Yeah, hive. I love this. There's Nobody so thinks needs. about dependencies. Well, we do. But the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. that goes to we your point about energy. Yeah, yeah, we actually. haven't. Yeah. Sorry, what was that orb? You said something <laughs> just before. <laughs> I like that sloth function asked if this has anything to do with the beehive. Mm. Um, good question. I mean, I, yeah, I guess it's more this like hives of activity. Mm. As in like Beyonce's fan club. Oh. <laughs> ah, yes. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> so like beehive, not like beehive. Uh, like bay, bay hive, bee. Come on, guys, come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, birthing hive. Oh, fire! Thank you, Very whoever cool. suggested that one. Ooh. It would, yeah, it would be so cool if um, if there was like yeah an integration the with the birthing hive just has lots of extension cords. And US to EU. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Snacks. Yeah, snacks. Very important. Just a meta moment. Um, <laughs> that one, that pink one. The pink one? Oh, wait. What? Are we going to go Are to you the worried? Hole? No, the whole. <gasps> oh my god, don't, don't fall. Let's just leave that. <laughs> oh, you just walked right past it. <laughs> so we just walked past like an Easter egg of the game. Yeah. Where. It's also Calum's greatest fear. We had a great question. Someone asked oh, yeah. us if you can die. Don't. Get away from the edge. Oh, no. Someone asked us if you can die in this game, and it's not really possible except for this lovely hole into the <laughs> void that Will left. Uh, Seamus okay. left. Seamus, thank, thank you. Thank you, Seamus. Yeah, we love Thank it. you. Um, and yeah, we're not going to show it because I think it would like crash everything. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't find our way back. <laughs> yeah. But it's a yeah. place, you know, it's important to represent that place. There's yeah. always, yeah. there's yeah. always, yeah. There's always an exit. You can always give up on your projects if you. We want. have exactly. a we have a question in the chat. So they say, based on this conversation, I was wondering how and why you arrived at referring to the project as a game as opposed to a virtual world or a digital memory palace. Such a good question. Could we? Yeah, we definitely thought about mm. it as memory palace. And Will and I had also like long conversations at the start of the project about yeah like is this a game um is it just a kind of a glorified visualization tool or something like that of which i think it's like i think it really became a game to me i feel like um but yeah i wonder how do you draw the line between like is it a world is it a game can it be those things at once it's really hard i think that i think for me at least what makes this a game while i, while I agree that it's also those things um i think that uh approaching this with uh, like the mentality of play is what makes this a game. Mm. And that, like you're bringing a playful attitude to exploring your own materials um, is, is yeah, what makes this a game. I don't know if you guys agree with that. I, and, yeah. yeah, and there's not like a single uh, set framework where like you're expected to put something somewhere, but really the like categorization of your um, inventory is emergent and mm. you can play with that. like try different possibilities and yeah nothing's mm. fixed yeah. if you don't want it to be there is a nice definition of a game that i can't remember who it's by but we discussed it in one of the trust reading groups and i think it's that a game is something where i think it's like you're doing an activity under a kind of arbitrary constraint mm -hmm. so it's like there is no reason that we're like making ourselves kind of oh there, there are several interesting reasons but yeah kind of forcing yourself like the constraint here is to 
talk about your project in this very unfamiliar way. Um, and yeah, that's like the kind of constraint. It's funny that constraints like make it playful in a way. Like it's really like giving mm -hmm. this kind of structure for how you talk about your work and then it forces you to think and talk about it quite differently. So yeah, that's like the, an interesting way to think about it maybe. Mm. Makes me think of like sandboxes also. Oh yeah, like uh, in what sense? Like as in there's like a, a border oh, between yeah. this more like chaotic that's true that's a, yeah that's mm. another part of that that definition of the game actually where it's like yeah it's like you're kind of in this little space yeah. circle not yeah. in the uh, real world um Definitely. which is nice someone also suggested a heterotopia oh mm. that's Ooh, that's nice that's really good chat is, is on fire yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chat is on fire thank you everyone. why joanna why do you think this is a heterotopia um i mean heterotopia means like a place a no place? How would you define it? I think a heterotopy is like it's saying that this binary between the utopia and the dystopia is false and that like every place or like especially if you're going to acknowledge history and acknowledge context and milieu, community, um, then like yeah you need to take it into account. Mm. I also thought it just means like airports as well you know like mm. an airport is a heterotopia where it's like this kind of place that's outside other places or like a place of transit mm. um, and yeah I don't know I, I think there should be like a heterotopia hive because like I feel like a lot of work gets done in weird in between spaces as well huh. as you're like particularly like I don't know for creative work so. I think this is part of that classic discussion of are you purposely putting yourself through hell while making our project. <laughs> that classic discussion. Uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Creating your own I know that one. Yeah, yeah, it's really project, true. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. That should be a hell high. <laughs> <laughs> and now I feel like there's a lot more um, interest in caring for yourself during mm. this process. Yeah. Mm. And so I hope that a place like the labyrinth can be a calming space to reflect and maybe to have revelations rather than <laughs> winding yourself around your own yeah. personal health. Yeah, but there is something that's, you know, hard and challenging about developing something that you made up mm. that no one necessarily needs, but that you feel like the endeavor of making it is somehow important. And yeah. that's a hard space to be in. Absolutely. Mm. So do you think you could take other people um as your hive group with you who had completely different projects than you and you just fill up the inventory and you just show each other things in the hive? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, you could almost imagine it being multiple people bringing different projects and doing the same kind of task or like, or, or being like in a multiplayer version, having people all walking together and doing this uh, keine of exploratory group sharing. Tour. Yeah. Oh, so nice. yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a group tour, mm. yeah. A group mind tour. Yeah, it would be really <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, we also talked about, I think at dinner, like you could put a, um, a science project in here, maybe. Mm. Um, or like, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a straight up arts project. It could also be like a design object that you kind of break down. Mm. Um, yeah, like research of any kind. I think it's really agnostic to what kind of project you could put in here. Mm. Um, cool. So should we start our way towards the last hive? Yes, let's do it. There's, in fact, a final hive has just emerged. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hello, hive. <laughs> <laughs> it's the big hive, yeah. in fact. It's like a cathedral. Yeah. All right, in we go. Okay. Someone asked, do I need VPN for this? So maybe it's a good prompt to explain how we want to ask people to engage. So like I said at the beginning, it, for those of you who missed it, just private message us mm. if you're interested in playing Hive Mind, being one of the kind of beta testers. We would love for you to try it, to mod the game, to contribute ideas. We'll be sharing the full Unreal project with documentation so that you could bring in your own materials that way as well. Yeah. 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 And I want to hear also if you guys think this would be helpful for your project teams or for sharing mm -hmm. between each other. Like, who would you want to be traveling as co-librarians and who would you want as your orb? Ooh, dream orbs. Mm. Yeah. Dream orbs. Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Shall we get into the 
final questions. Yeah. So tell me how this session has transformed how you think about your tool. We've gotten a lot of feedback. Who wants to start? Take I your think, time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean that sarcastically. Ask a <laughs> when they already have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I think that what's been interesting about hive mind and like knowing that we would present it or talk about it using the tool itself that we're building like um it really foregrounded the process we should also mention that um we didn't get to all the hives today like one of the hives looked at technology that didn't get to uh one looks at process that we didn't get to so like um it's also nice that in this session we didn't kind of there's more left Th like untouched. completion is not necessarily reaching all the hives mm -hmm. or like um and when thinking about like knowledge when thinking about like operational chains and all this stuff it is often like super dry um coming out of academia in this like very alienating language that you need a phd to really fully understand or engage with and so like for me, it's that knowledge can be played with and that um, like we don't have notes in front of us today. We don't have like precise information, but like <laughs> we were prompted by the hives. We were able to bring up this information, like these materials that we've worked with and mm -hmm. talk about them and discuss them with each other in a casual way and in a playful way. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, just realizing that archiving and knowledge can be played with. Yeah. I was also thinking a lot about like the the memory palace concept and like right now we're sharing something that we've just been working on and just finished but the thought also of this being a kind of playful tool for exploring a project or concepts that have been like long left untouched by oneself or by somebody else I think um, is just such an appealing way of, of exploring ideas not necessarily like, in a folder but through a world. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, it's like being able to walk through kind of your like scraps and your files and the screenshots on your desktop and stuff like right. that. Um, I guess for me, it just makes me think about how much work it was and like also how much fun it was. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, because it's so often when you finish a project, you just think about the end result. But like, this is mm. strange because like because we had this meta version of the game today, I don't know, yeah, it's like I, we were really able to just think about like this whole journey and I feel really proud of us, so yeah. <laughs> it was such a cozy project. Like, it was throughout. really good, yeah, That's it was fun. really fun as well. Mm. Like it I, I makes me think about how like nice it was to work with both of you. <laughs> Likewise. It was yeah. nice to work Aww. with you too. Yeah, yeah. emotional. Um, and now I, we're in person for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we met, Serpentine brought us together. Thank you, Serpentine. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah. I think um, what I was so impressed by, I'm breaking the fourth wall of the orb. <laughs> no, the, or the orb is still talking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I heard from the people at the Serpentine was that you were really diligent in the way that you scoped the project and sort of borrowed from um, like maybe gaming studio culture and project organization. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about that because in talking to you guys this week you've been very relaxed and cozy as Callum said and I think that you owe that to you know such good foregrounding. Mm. Joanna maybe I know you were kind of the lead on that. Maybe I mean I did a little that. bit at the front end of the project and then and then Will and Callum took over. Actually in, in the reading group about operational chains we talked about <laughs> project management as like a special <laughs> as an art um, yeah. and yeah, I, I think like we all just, we like to be relaxed, all three of us, we like to keep things calm. And so it was cool to set up the project in a way where we actually had, you know, quite a limited timeline. Um, we basically set up these different sprints for the different things that needed to be built or discussed or explored. Um, we had some people leading on a sprint and some people supporting and it was like kind of different configurations. So we all got to work, yeah, in different constellations with each other. Mm. Um, and yeah, it really helped also like we had this, this, which is today, like our hard deadline and we kind of worked <laughs> backwards from there and now we're here. So yeah, it was yeah. a success, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, totally. yeah. I think also like, at least for me as it, from the, like a game design perspective, I come from like a, a really intense 
like have a game that works very quick and then have a lot of time to make it not crash and feel okay. Um, but having, I think we had a, we had something that we could play very early on, which uh, gave us some time to like really think about and refine it and like question what we were working with and how we wanted it to come across and actually make the world. Um, but the, the kind of seed was, was kind of in place pretty, pretty early. This goes to Victoria's point about it being a research game for psychotherapeutic healing. Yes, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, you Definitely. can retell the story of a very traumatic journey on a project design. <laughs> for us, that wasn't the case because we had a really great time working on this. Yeah. But yeah, I think you can kind of rewrite your own experience of like mm. of a of a stressful project or one that was a lot of work or one that didn't really w work out as planned. Um, and yeah, Will made the music for this, which makes it super calming and <laughs> lovely. So Thank that you. really adds a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's nice. I think that it's good to have, yeah, like I think you talked about it all as like a, a kind of space of care. So I don't know, mm. I'm, I'm glad that people feel that way about it. So what, what's gonna happen when we exit the game? What's gonna happen to us? I don't know. Um, we We're might drift away a little bit. Mm. We might drift away. The maze will sleep until the next playthrough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah. A Have a good Thank evening, so everyone, and please write us in the chat if you want to play Hive Mind. See you next time.